I'm going to speak out loud <laughs> what everyone already knows. And what am I going to speak out loud? Well, stay tuned for this edition of Cornfield Theology. <laughs> Hey everyone, what's going on? Pastor Sean here, back at you with another edition of Cornfield Theology. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for taking interest. I do these particular podcasts uh, for a couple couple of reasons. One, for our local church, Redemption Hill Church, which is located in the Des Moines metro. Um, Trying to pump out more content outside of our Sunday context for their edification and growth as they wrestle with various theological issues and how theological issues, frankly, engage our world, right? And so uh, that's for that. And then I know a lot of other people listen in and kind of peering into what we have to say, and uh, hopefully we're a blessing there as well. So if you want to learn more about Redemption Hill Church and uh, the ministry that supports this particular um, podcast, go to redemptionhilldsm.org. And as you can tell, at least if you're watching on YouTube, I am solo today. If you're just listening in on a podcast, yeah, this is the only voice you're going you're gonna to hear for the next few minutes, but I hope it's still uh, profitable for you as we, as we wrestle with a particular um, issue that, frankly, let's just be honest, no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to talk about it. Um, very rarely do you hear churches talk about this particular issue. Oh, certainly in culture. Culture does not mention this particular word. It does not. It will not. It has been substituted out long ago. And churches, unfortunately, have just followed the culture's lead on this in many situations and in many local churches. And here's the word. It's, it's, it it's runs roughshod all throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The word is sin. Ooh, how'd that make you feel, right? <laughs> He's going to talk about sin, man. <laughs> It's just like good, right? Well, at the end, by the time I'm done, it's it's good that we are talking about sin. And uh, that's where I want to lead you. I want to talk about what is sin. What does it mean for a person to be a sinner? And and really, frankly, why we do need to talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it and understand sin well, then frankly, you're not gonna you're not gonna apply the solution properly. Now, like I already mentioned, culture's not gonna talk about the sin the way the Bible talks about sin. Uh, you might hear things like, 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 let me give you an example. You, you know, let's say you, you're, um, you got a coworker, right? And, uh, nice enough guy or gal and he, he or she messes up. Right. And, um, it's, I'm not talking like a mess up, like a, like a computer error, right? Let's say you're a computer programmer in IT. I'm talking like something bad. They did something bad to another person. Now they come and confess to you or they may not use the word of confession. But they may just simply say, Hey, can I, can I, can I talk to you about something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They talk to you because they trust you, whatever. And they say something like, hey, I made a mistake. <laughs> I made a mistake. What, what they're not saying, what they really mean is that I've sinned. I've done something against another person. I've done something um, that is morally against <laughs> this other person, right? There's a particular rule or a law, as we read in the Old Testament, right? And I broke that. I violated that. And culture says it's a mistake. You know, it's an oops. Nope, didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. You know, you along with not hearing the word sin, you're not going to hear the word forgiveness in culture. And as I've already mentioned, many churches, many liberal churches, when I say liberal, I mean theologically liberal churches, have jettisoned the word sin. They've jettisoned the word forgiveness, and they've substituted it or they've dumbed it down, right? You know, like, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. And, you know, in our modern vernacular and colloquially, like, that, that might be fine, right? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. I made a mistake. But there still has to be a category of, I'm not only sorry, please forgive me because I have sinned against you. And I have sinned, as we read Psalm 51, I have sinned against God. Like, that is that that has much more depth and meaning um, when we talk about what the Bible says of how to deal with sin, not just our mistakes. And we'll we'll tease that out a little bit more. And you know, I, I grew up religious, and maybe you connect with this if you're if you're listening or watching. Like I grew up Catholic. Um, you know, I was a good Catholic boy, real good Catholic boy in the sense that uh, I went to mass every single week and um, was pretty faithful for a while. You know, in, in my late teens and then high school there, I began to question a lot of things. And, you know, uh, as, as we say, kind of in the evangelical circles, I didn't get saved to my early 20s. But, you know, I, I did the Catholic thing. And, um, you know, I've even prayed at the various grottos whenever, whenever they were by and light, light the candles and all that kind of stuff. I was an altar boy, I think, well into high school. 
you know, ringing the bells and, you know, kneeling and getting up and holding the book for the priest and all that kind of stuff and helping out with, with, um, with the Eucharist and whatever else have you. And I heard a lot about sin. I heard a ton about sin, actually, in the Catholic Church. But, there, but it was spoken about in such a way where it felt like there was such condemnation all the time. Like, I, I always felt like I could not do enough to overcome my sin, right? And that actually is true. There's nothing I can do to overcome my sin. But yet, with that being said, the message is always, you can, if you can just do better, if you can just do better, if you can do, you know, at the end of the day, if you could do better, if that is possible, then the scales of justice before you die will be, you know, uh, my good works are down here. And that, that outweighs my bad deeds, my sin. And therefore, you know, potentially at that point, you have a, you know, have a right to get to heaven or an opportunity to get to heaven. And then you got purgatory in there. And it was a big old mess. And so the Catholic Church did talk about sin. Didn't talk about, didn't talk about it rightly all the time. But one thing that is for sure, they never spoke about the proper solution to a person's sin. Like, Because here's the deal. Here's what we all know. Uh, we cannot do enough good works to overcome our sin. Because every single sin, as we're going to see here in a moment from R.C. Sproul, every single sin, no matter how slight or big, is cosmic treason against God, against a holy and just God. Your slightest sin that you did today is cosmic treason. What language, what, a, what powerful language, what helpful language. And so we got to ask the question, if that is true, is there a way in which I can be reconciled? And again, that's biblical language. I can be reconciled to a God that I'm at enmity with because of my sin. And if there is a way to be reconciled, what does that look like? And so growing up Catholic, I just never had those kind of categories. I was never taught the proper solution. And frankly, we still need to talk about sin. Like at Redemption Hill Church, we talk about sin because if you don't talk about sin, then you, then you don't know how to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't apply uh, the solution if you don't talk about the problem. And so we have to talk about the problem. Uh, but we got to have it all, right? we got to understand the entire gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, while, while I'm bashing on Catholics, it seems like, for a moment, I'm not, I'm not trying to by any means, what I am going to say is this. You, you go to a fundamentalist church, and they sound very Catholic, right? you got to conform to their particular culture in order to be saved. You gotta you gotta live up to a particular moral standard to be saved. And there's very little talk about the grace and mercy that is found in faith and knowing Jesus Christ, which is the right solution. And so I think any Protestant or Catholic needs to take an honest look at their own heart and understand how their own how how scripture informs who they are and their particular nature. So uh, again, not trying to bash on Catholics. I think any Protestant church is in danger of becoming, you know, quote, Catholic if they're not careful. Um, and as I already mentioned, you know, culture is just not going to talk about sin at all either, right? They're going to talk about, you know, like I said, mistakes or oops, oopsie, did that, you know. And sometimes honest mistakes do happen. That's that's not the category that I'm referencing necessarily. Um Here's a helpful quote, and I'm going to be using R.C. Sproul's um, blog called Cosmic Treason, just to kind of help us think through and help us along this particular discussion on sin. Um, he says this, uh, The sinfulness of sin sounds like a vacuous redundancy that adds no information to the subject under discussion. However, the necessity of speaking of the sinfulness of sin has been thrust upon us by a culture and even a church that has dismissed the significance of sin itself. Sin is communicated in our day in terms of making mistakes or making poor choices. Uh, it says down a little further down in the paragraph here, sin is more than a mistake. It is an act of moral transgression. Now that is pretty powerful and pretty helpful. It's more than making a mistake or an oops. What's the other word that he used? Poor choices, right? But it is it is cosmic treason. It is uh, an act of moral transgression against God. Now, I'm a, our local church is a part of a denomination called Trinity Fellowship Churches, and we have a particular confession of faith that's built off of and 
and uh, built, basically built off the 1689 uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith, and we've modernized it for our day and for our particular denomination. But if you are familiar with the Westminster Confession of Faith or the 1689, uh, this might sound familiar to you, because this is, this is what we read in section 7, uh, points 1 and 2 about sin. God created man upright and perfect and gave him a righteous law. And we'll talk about that when we go to Genesis 2:16. And this righteous law, which secured his life and kept it and threatened death if he broke it. So here's the righteous law. And if you break it, there are consequences for your actions. So you see a kind of a, a conditional nature here. Yet Adam did not live long in this honor. Satan used the, the, subtle, the subtlety of the serpent to subdue Eve and by her seduced Adam. <laughs> What's interesting here is that Adam is on the hook. Now, we're not talking about blame shifting here. We're talking about biblical headship. Like, you know, Ad, or Eve ate the fruit from the tree and was tempted by the serpent, serpent, and then Adam kind of comes in. He's like, hey, what you got there, Eve? You know, bites from from the fruit. And who's who's on the hook here? It is Adam and Eve, but who gets called out first? Adam. It continues on in, in, in point one of section seven of the Trinity Fellowship Church's Confession of Faith. Adam, without any compulsion, willfully transgressed the law of their creation and the command given to them in eating the forbidden fruit. God was pleased to permit this according to his wise and holy counsel, having purpose to direct it to its own glory. So even though Adam sinned, God is still going to be glorified ultimately through all this. And this is where and you know you're in Genesis, and you're thinking forward to okay, how is this? How is this all going to work out in the end, according to God's good plan and purpose, and you know according to the counsel of His will? And how's all this going to bring Him glory? Well, that's why you keep reading Scripture past Genesis two, right? Now here's point two of section seven. By this sin, our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. So basically, sin entered the world. The entire creation is stained with sin, and every person is holy and totally. Now, here's the theological word that gets thrown around. Everyone's holy and totally depraved because of our first parents, Adam and Eve, because of their sin. So it continues, we fell on them, for by it death came upon us all and became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. Now, you can find that at the Redemption Hill website or at the Trinity Fellowship Church's website where you got our entire confession of faith, but also more on that. I think it's two, two, two points of, you know, several points in that particular section. So, but saying the word sin, 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 now we got to ask the question, what is sin, right? What makes sin different than, uh, different than, you know, my mistakes or my oopses or my bad choices, right? Well, at Redemption Hill Church, we offer a theological foundations class, and due to the pandemic, we've been offering it online via Zoom, and we've been going through in this particular class Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. And so, there are a lot of good theology books out there. Um, we're using this particular one because most people know about it, and it's very accessible. And uh, theologically speaking, Wayne Grudem and I are going to agree upon more things than not. Although I can point to other systematic theology books that I probably would prefer. But most people know who Wayne Grudem is and his particular systematic theology book, at least in the circles that I run in. And he says this about sin. Sin is a failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. So act, so what you do, your attitude, that's kind of talking about the heart. You're not conforming to the moral law of God in what you do what in your heart. So attitude and then nature, just your, your being, right? And we've already said that uh, R.C. Sproul said, sin is more than a mistake. It is an act of moral transgression, right? Um, sin is cosmic treason, right? So let's get back to another quote from Spurgeon because, again, it's just really helpful. And here's what he says. Sin is cosmic treason. What I meant, he was re referencing a particular, another article he wrote, what I meant by the statement, cosmic treason, was that even the slightest sin that a creature commits against his creator does violence to the creator's holiness, his, go his glory, and his righteousness. Every sin, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is an act of rebellion against the sovereign God who reigns and rules over us, and as such, an act of treason against the cosmic king. 
That's again RC Sproul. Uh, pretty pretty amazing, and he continues to flesh out. And I think this is helpful for you as you try to wrestle with you know what is sin. Three particular areas where there is sin or a cosmic treason. He talks about one particular category of debt. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Another category of enmity, and another category of simply transgressed against a law or the law. So talk about debt. Uh, one way to sin against God is that. You have made many bad errors in your life. You have done many sins, and uh, you can't pay them back, right? I mean, think about if you have, like, um, let's say you uh, go to college, and you're just not financially astute, and then you go to uh, get a PhD at the end. Or maybe you go to law school, right? And then at the end of all that, you've got, like, I don't know, $250,000 of student debt, and you just simply ask him, and then you go be a barista, <laughs> and you don't go to law, you don't study, you don't practice law, but you go be a barista. Nothing against baristas, but like, how are you going to pay back two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? That debt is is burying you and crushing you, and so our sin is crushing us, right? God is good and holy and just, and our sin has separated us. It's, there is a barrier, there is a uh, a chasm, and so. Um, I fail to uh, keep the moral obligations of my debt. That's part of the problem here. Um, and so debt, that, that first category is really helpful. And, and frankly, a lot of people understand that category. I owe God something in a sense, and I can't give it to him. I, you know, My debt has completely made me morally bankrupt in order to move forward. So debt's one way. Uh, enmity, a distance between God and man, basically due to sin. Um so, so what, think about this in, in terms of, of marriage, right? Let's say um, a husband commits a sin against his wife or a wife commits a sin against a husband. And all of a sudden there's enmity, there's strife between the two. And we're talking about real sin, real everyday issues between a husband and a wife. You can pick two people, frankly, any two people. And the question becomes, how do they get reconciled? If there's distance and enmity between the two, you know, the, the, let's say the husband sinned and he's like not owning up to, and the wife's frustrated and, and doesn't want to talk to the husband. And what do we do to bring reconciliation between the two? Well, that, that needs to be worked out in a sinner's relationship with God. What does it look like to bring reconciliation? Um, that's important. We'll talk about that as well. The third way we can talk about sin is, We've transgressed against the law. Think of the Old Testament, right? You got like the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, and we've broken that particular law. We can make it real simple. There's a lot more commandments in the Old Testament. We want to just we take ten. <laughs> can you keep the ten? I I I dare you to try. Uh, most people, not all people, can't. They're gonna break one of those commandments at some point. And so uh, we can even you know go into the New Testament. Think about Christ's. Sermon on the Mount. Man, talk about upping the ante on living in a particular way that honors God. Like, like Jesus just doesn't go after a person's actions. He goes after a person's attitude, right? So I'll take an Old Testament uh, commandment, right? Ten Commandments. Honor thy, thy father and mother. What Jesus would say is like, not only honor them, but in your heart, love them well. <laughs> you know, it's it's a heart condition. That's when, you know, Grudem mentions the word attitude in his definition of sin, right? He's trying to get to something deeper than doing, although the action is significant as well, but there's more. There's more going on. So the Sermon on the Mount is actually tremendously helpful in helping us to understand sin and our sin nature. Now, oftentimes in the, the theological world, if you read a systematic theology book, you can read Wayne Grudem, you can read really any systematic theology book, you're going you're gonna to hear things like sins of omission and sins of commission. Um, basically, sins of commission is a sin of, is a uh, doing what we shouldn't do. So like something you do that you shouldn't do would be like you lie. Or if you want to get you know really into it, uh, murder. Like you murder someone. You know you shouldn't do it. You did it anyways. That's called a sin of commission. There's another way to think about sin. It's called a sin of omission. Uh, sins of omission is a sin that takes place because of not doing something that is right. You know, so for example, let's say let's say I'm just I'm just chilling out uh, middle of town, and um, let, let's say I see someone completely clock another person in the back of the head, right? And I just sit there and I do nothing. I do nothing to make sure that there's justice done to the person who did the clocking. 
uh, or I do nothing to help the person who is indeed the victim of getting clocked in the back of the head for what would be, you know, let's say, for example, for the sake of illustration, for seemingly no real reason. Like if I just sit back and I do nothing, like like there's some there's some sense of sin of omission. I should be doing something. Perhaps better examples would include this. Examples include, um, let's we can even make it Christian. You know you should pray, but you don't pray. Right? Um, you know you should be standing up for what is right. Going back to my example of just kind of hanging out around town, but you don't do anything. You, you know you know what the right thing to do is, but you don't do the right thing. Uh, again, go back to a Christian example. As a Christian, you're supposed to share Christ with other people, but you don't do it, right, for whatever reason, you know. Well, those are sins of omission, which leads me to, again, one more quote from our guy, our man, our dude, R.C. Sproul. He said this, our crimes are not virtues. It's so it's so crazy. We live in this world where things are just getting completely turned around. Completely turn around. Like, what what is what is now wrong is being celebrated, and what people um, should not be doing. Let me say it different. What people should not be doing is celebrated, and what we should be doing is being demeaned. Let me give you a great example. It used to be, and this is very biblical. That uh, let's take the issue of sex. Sex is between. Uh, we have marriage is between a man and a woman, and sex is done in the confines of marriage. That's what we read in scripture. But that's not celebrated anymore. That's old-fashioned, right? Uh, these days, it's like everything else is celebrated. And you all know, you can you know, catalog in your head what everything else is. But you know what? If you are practicing celibacy until you get married, you're, you're, an, you're a fuddy-duddy. You're old school. You're weird. You're backwards. And you know what? You're probably bigoted too. <laughs> that's where we're at in culture. But all this other stuff, man, that is absolutely celebrated. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And our crimes are not virtues. Our sin is not a virtue. It is not a virtue to God. <sighs> all right, uh, R.C. Sproul continues. They are vices. So our crimes are not virtues. They are vices. And any transgression of a holy God is vicious by nature. And then he ends his article. It says, not until we take God seriously will we ever take sin seriously. It's interesting how he starts with taking God seriously instead of taking sin seriously. Uh, some people will turn it around and say, um, until we take sin seriously, it's hard to take God seriously. But no, he says, until you take God seriously, you're not going to take sin seriously. So what are the consequences of taking sin seriously but not God seriously? Well, it's just being condemned, right? Let's say you have no thought for God, but you're going to try to take your sin seriously. Well, you're going to keep failing. Yeah, you're going to fail. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to be like me growing up. You're going, to, you're going to feel the weight of condemnation because you don't have a thought for God or the gospel, but you're just trying to be a good person. But if you take God seriously, then you know what? You're going to end up taking sin seriously. Um, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta work the right way. Don't work backwards. You gotta work the right way. Start with who God is. Start with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then you'll understand how to take sin seriously. Now, there are several passages in the Bible, of course, and I think it's important in a conversation where I keep talking about how the Bible is full of examples of talking about sin. It's important that we probably should go there, right? So let's just reference a few here. I'm gonna start in the book of Genesis. Genesis 2.16, and we talk about, you know, the law being broken, um, uh, that there was a particular law that existed before, like, you know, Moses came down with the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai, he's got the tablets, and he's trying to hold them up because they're so heavy and big, and, you know, before that, there was another law, and we call it the Edemic Law, under the Edemic Covenant, we got a law, and in Genesis 2.16, it reads, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, the man being Adam, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat, you shall die. So if you eat the tree, if you eat the tree, Adam, or excuse me, you eat the fruit from the tree, guess what, Adam? <laughs> you will die. A command has been put in place, a conditional command. If you do this, then this will happen. And so we see here that a law is laid down. And, and, you know, if you have any type of religious background, you probably know the story of what happened, right? 
you know, as I already mentioned, Eve eats the fruit, Adam eats the fruit. And then what we read in Genesis 3, uh, they kicked out of the garden. You know, the serpent tricks them or however you want to articulate that. Uh, I actually did a sermon fairly recently on Genesis 3, uh, which you can find at our website if you want to th- learn more about that particular passage and what the sequence of events means. But uh, sin entered the world, and all of a sudden there were consequences. There were consequences for the serpent. There were consequences for Eve. There were consequences for Adam. And it's interesting. I think this is really helpful that this is said in terms of the consequences um, that we read about in Genesis 3. 15, and this is the consequences to the serpent. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, because you've, because you have gone on your way to deceive Adam and Eve, cursed are you above all livestock, (laughs) above everything, above the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and on the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, here is the, here is what we call the, the Proto-Evangelion, um, the first gospel that is preached. Here we are in Genesis 3, right? There's a, there's a lot of pages, a lot of words in the Bible, and right here we get a taste of, okay, well, where's this headed, you know? What is the plan and purpose of God? Well, um, God says this to the serpent, I will put enmity, there's that word again, that word enmity between you and the woman, so there's going to be, you know, strain between you and the woman, rightfully so, in between your offspring and her offspring. He, interesting how we have the, the uh, male pronoun here. He shall bruise your head so that he shall bruise the head of the serpent and you shall bruise his heel. We have this idea that the serpent's head is ultimately going to be crushed, even though the serpent may bruise the heel of this he. Now, who is that he? Of course, it's Jesus Christ. That's what we see on the cross. That's what we call this a proto-euangelion. It's the first glimpse of the gospel being spoken. So that's pretty amazing. Now we can move ahead into the New Testament, and there's much more we could talk about in the Old Testament. I recommend going to Psalm 51, for example. Psalm 51, um, the time when David committed adultery, um, slept with Bathsheba, killed Uriah, um, and then uh, repents, and then Psalm 51 is part of his repentance. And he talks about his own sin and transgression. I mean, think about that. We've got, we got an adulterer and a murderer. I mean, just, okay, everyone talks about David's the greatest king, and okay, I get that, at least in the you know Old Testament standards. He's the greatest king, and he was an adulterer and a murderer. Psalm 51, go read Psalm 51 when you got a moment. But for right now, I'm in uh, Romans 5. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came in, the, came in through the world through one man, again, that one man being Adam, and death through sin. So with, with Adam came sin and death. You're going to die. That was, that was the condition of, of, from God from Genesis 2. If you eat of the fruit, you will die. So when he ate the fruit, guess what entered the world? Death. And so that's what happened. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So you see, what we have this, we have what we call, once again, um, total depravity. Because of Adam and Eve, sin entered the world. Because all things are now stained, and, uh, and all things need to be redeemed. And all man and woman have sinned, and have a sin nature. And then, this is the popular one. If you've ever done the Romans Road thing, I didn't grow up Christian, like I said, so... I never knew the Romans road track, but perhaps you do. Romans three twenty three: For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So not only in verse twenty three do we have the problem, verse twenty four of Romans three, we got the solution. And so let me just let me just plead with you and just hear me: If you've grown up, whether it was a Catholic context like I was, or even at a church, you know, I mentioned earlier, fundamentalist churches, which act, which act very Catholic. If you grew up always feeling like um, condemnation has come upon you because of the weight of sin, oh my goodness, is verse 24 so powerful. You cannot stop at verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Move on to verse 24. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So receive what God has done in Christ 
through his blood, who there's atoning, dud through his through through his atoning blood, through his substitutionary atonement. You do, you do indeed deserve to be on the cross, but Jesus says, "Nah, nah, I got this. I got this for you." So by faith, if you believe that, then you are what we get back to that enmity. We get back to that enmity. That empty no longer exists. But you've been reconciled to your father. And here's the thing. Um, and this is, this is what I was not taught in the Catholic Church. If you have been made right before God, if you've been reconciled, uh, the New, Te- New Testament uses words adoption. I think of Ephesians 1, right? We've been adopted through his blood. Uh, then God, your father, loves you so much. He cares for you so much. And he, 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 he wants what's best for you. Uh, he is not going to crush you. He has, indeed, he's going to do the opposite. He wants to see you flourish. He wants to bless you. And I'm not talking like in a prosperity gospel nonsense. I'm talking about he wants what's best for you. And he wants you to conform your life to your Savior, Jesus, right? Because that is what's good for you. And that brings glory to the Father that took you out of bondage because of sin and into freedom through Jesus Christ. I mean, what kind of love do we see there um, with God, with God the Father? You know, so if you if you if you were like me and you grew up, you know, kind of in the way to condemnation, receive that. Move on from verse twenty three, and verse twenty three is very important in Romans three. Get on to verse twenty four and verse twenty five. And now here's another another um, particular passage from Romans six, where we see for the wages of sin is death. It's true. That maybe we, before we had like enmity language, now we're back to debtor language here. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God. Is eternal life now? How do we? How do you obtain this eternal life? It's through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and that is how it's obtained. So these are really important texts for you to wrestle with, for you to grapple with. And again, if you feel like you've you've been under the weight of sin, God says, "Hey, turn to Christ." So if you're listening and you're not a Christian, or you just you just kind of you know, hey, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, I'm going on a faith journey. I hate, you know what? I went on a faith journey <laughs> several years, asking a lot of hard questions, looked at a lot of different religions. And, and what's interesting, when I went on my faith journey, which lasted two to three years, I was simply trying to ask the question, how do I deal with sin? Right? And it was through, it was Christianity that offered a solution that I felt like uh, was most reasonable and most honest. It was honest in that it it dealt with sin. It acknowledged it for what it is, right? It is debt. It is enmity, right? It is I have broken a standard, a particular law, right? And it answered the question, well, then what? How do I be reconciled to the maker of the universe? And that is through Jesus Christ. I, in my, For my money, there's no other faith tradition, no other religion that offers the solution that Christianity has through Jesus Christ. Just for, just from like a, I don't know, like an epistemological perspective, right? Just think of it that way, kind of an ethereal perspective. No other religion offers the solution that Christianity has. And it's because of these two particular words, by the way, grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. I remember this, I remember this story. I, I've used it before in a past sermon where, you know, there's a particular British conference taking place. I'm going back to the day of C.S. Lewis. There's a particular British conference taking place. And at the conference, if I could recall correctly, a bunch of theologians and philosophers were were pontificating about, you know, the differences and the distinction that Christianity is to the rest of the world of religions. What, what makes Christianity different from, say, Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or the various other religions that do exist? And I'm just mentioning some of the major ones. And everyone's just like, I don't know, that all kind of looks the same to me, and more liberal theologians. And then C.S. Lewis walks into the room, and they ask him, so what do you think, Mark, makes makes Christianity different? He said, that's easy. It's grace. God gives you what you do not deserve, Christian. He has given you his son, Jesus, as the substitute on the cross And in that substitutionary atonement, you've been forgiven of your sin. He gives you Christ. And by faith, we we believe that. We receive that. And we live in that reality. And so we go to Romans 8, 1, 8. There's therefore now 
There's therefore now no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. Praise God, right? And again, if you're not a Christian and you're watching or listening, I just plead with you to turn to Christ as your all satisfying joy. And turn to Him. Believe by faith that He died for your sin and He has He rose from the grave and then He eventually ascended into heaven. There'll be and He will one day come back to restore everything. Right? The process of reconciliation and restoration is is taking place spiritually, but there will be a day when all things will be restored. Indeed, creation still groans, right? Again, we read that in Romans 8. But Christ will come back. So I, I don't know if, if, you, if you're not a Christian and you just feel stirring right now. That could be the Holy Spirit, what we call the Holy Spirit, drawing you to himself to repent of your sin. And repent simply means to turn from your sin, turn away from it, and turn toward God. And just ask God, I plead out to him, cry out. And uh, may God pour out his mercy and grace upon you as he's poured out on me. He's poured out on my wife and poured out on many, many people. And uh, that is the good news of the gospel. So yeah, we started with sin, right? <laughs> no one wants to talk about sin. I won't, but I'm going to speak out loud what nobody wants to talk about. But we, talk, we start with sin because if you continue to walk through what we read in Scripture, it leads us to the Savior, the sinless Savior who overcame sin and death, and who offers a better way for us to live, a better way for us to think, a better attitude in our heart conforming into his image. And so that's the good news. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. I do hope this is profitable for you. Again, uh, some of those things that I mentioned, uh, Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology, uh, Cosmic Treason by um, R.C. Sproul. You can also reference uh, what I had already mentioned, um, our Confession of Faith at Trinity Fellowship Churches talks a little bit about what sin is. and also talks about, by the way, in our Confession, the solution to sin, um, our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is it. Uh, well, thanks for t- uh, listening. Take care. God bless. Peace out. Until next time, you're listening to Cornfield Theology. Bye-bye.